This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Delini Jaising. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Three, Part Fourteen. To the other vices which degraded the literary character was added, towards the close of the reign of Charles the Second, the most savage intemperance of party spirit. The wits as a class had been impelled by their old hatred of Puritanism to take the side of the court, and had been found useful allies. Dryden, in particular, had done good service to the government. Is Absalom and Archetopal, the greatest satire of modern times, had amazed the town, had made its way with unprecedented rapidity even into rural districts, and had, whatever it appeared, bitterly annoyed the exclusionists and raised the courage of the Tories. But we must not, in the admiration which we naturally feel for noble diction and versification, forget the great distinctions of good and evil. The spirit by which Dryden and several of his compeers were at this time animated against the Whigs deserves to he called fiendish. The servile judges and sheriffs of those evil days could not shed blood as fast as the poets cried out for it. Calls for more victims, high dears dress and banging, bitter taunts, and those who, having stood by the king in the hour of danger, now advised him to deal mercifully and generously by his vanquished enemies, who publicly resided on the stage, and that nothing might, he wanting, to the quit and to the shame, were recited by women, who, having long been taught to discard all modesty, were not taught to discard all compassion. It is a remarkable fact that, while the lighter literature of England was thus becoming a nuisance and a national disgrace, the English genius was effecting in science a revolution which will, to the end of time, be reckoned among the highest achievements of the human intellect. Bacon had sown the good seed in a sluggish soil and an ungenial season. He had not expected an early crop and in his last testament had solemnly bequeathed his fame to the next age. During a whole generation his philosophy had, amidst tumults, wars, and prescriptions, been slowly ripening in a few well-constituted minds. While factions were struggling for dominion over each other, a small body of sages had turned away with benevolent disdain from the conflict, and had devoted themselves to the nobler work of extending the dominion of man over matter. As soon as tranquillity was restored, these teachers easily found attentive audience. For the discipline through which the nation had passed had brought the public mind to a temper well fitted for the reception of the very Lamian doctrine. The civil troubles had stimulated the faculties of the educated classes and had called forth a restless activity and an insatiable curiosity such as had not before been known among us. Yet the effect of those troubles was that schemes of political and religious reform were generally regarded with suspicion and contempt. During twenty years the chief employment of busy and ingenious men had been to frame constitutions with first magistrates, without first magistrates, with hereditary senates, with senates appointed by lot, with annual senates, with perpetual senates. In these plans nothing was omitted. All the detail, all the nomenclature, all the ceremonial of the imaginary government was fully set forth. Polymarchs and phylarchs, tribes and galaxies, the Lord Archon and the Lord Strategist, which ballad boxes were to be green and which red, which walls were to be of gold and which of silver, which magistrates were to wear hats and which black velvet caps with peaks, how the mass was to be carried and when the heralds were to uncover. These and a hundred more such trifles were gravely considered and arranged by men of no common capacity and learning. But the time for these visions had gone by, and if any steadfast Republican still continued to amuse himself with them, fear of public derision and of a criminal information generally induced him to keep his fancies to himself.
it was now unpopular and unsafe to mutter a word against the fundamental laws of the monarchy but daring and ingenious men might indemnify themselves by treating with disdain what had lately been considered as the fundamental laws of nature the torrent which had been dammed up in one channel rushed violently into another the revolutionary spirit ceasing to operate in politics began to exert itself with unprecedented vigour and hardihood in every department of physics the year sixteen sixty the era of the restoration of the old constitution is also the era from which dates the ascendancy of the new philosophy in that year the royal society destined to be a chief agent in a long series of glorious and salutary reforms began to exist in a few months experimental science became all the mode the transfusion of blood the ponderation of air the fixation of mercury succeeded to that place in the public mind which had been lately occupied with the controversies of the rota dreams of perfect forms of government made way for dreams of wings which men were to fly from the tower to the abbey and of double keel ships which were never to founder in the fire cast storm all classes were hurried along by the prevailing sentiment qualia and roundhead churchman and puritan were for once allied divines jurists statesmen nobles princes swelled the triumph of the baconian philosophy poets sang which emulous fervour the approach of the golden age cowley in lines weighty with thought and resplendent with wit urged the chosen seed to take possession of the promised land flowing with milk and honey that land which their great deliverer and lawgiver had seen as from the summit of pisgah but had not been permitted to enter dryden with more zeal than knowledge joined voice to the general acclamation to enter and fought all things which neither he nor anybody else understood the royal society he predicted would soon lead us to the extreme verge of the globe and there delight us with a better view of the moon two able and aspiring prelates ward bishop of salisbury and wickings bishop of chester were conspicuous among the leaders of the movement its history was eloquently written by a younger divine who was rising to high distinction in his profession thomas pratt afterwards bishop of rochester both chief justice hale and lord keeper guildford stole some hours from the business of their courts to write on hydrostatics indeed it was under the immediate direction of guildford that the first barometers ever exposed to sale in london were constructed chemistry divided for a time with wine and love with the stage and the gaming table with the intrigues of a courtier and the intrigues of a demagogue the attention of the fickle buckingham rupert has the credit of having invented mesotinto from him is named that curious bubble of glass which has long amused children and puzzled philosophers charles himself had a laboratory at whitehall and was far more active and attentive there than at the council board it was almost necessary to the character of a fine gentleman to have something to say about air pumps and telescopes and even fine ladies now and then though it becoming to affect a taste for science went in coaches and six to visit the gresham curiosities and broke forth into cries of delight at finding that a magnet really attracted a needle and that a microscope really made a fly loom as large as a sparrow in this as in every great stir of the human mind there was doubtless something which might well move a smile it is the universal law that whatever pursuit whatever doctrine becomes fashionable shall lose a portion of that dignity which it had possessed while it was confined to a small but earnest minority and was loved for its own sake alone it is true that the follies of some persons who without any real aptitude for science professed a passion for it furnished matter of contemptuous mirth to a few malignant satirists who belonged to the preceding generation and were not disposed to unlearn the law of their youth 
But it is not less true that the great work of interpreting nature was performed by the English of that age, as it had never before been performed in any age by any nation. The spirit of Francis Bacon was abroad, a spirit admirably compounded of audacity and sobriety. There was a strong persuasion that the whole world was full of secrets of high moment to the happiness of man, and that man had by his maker been entrusted with the key which rightly used would give access to them there was at the same time a conviction that in physics it was impossible to arrive at the knowledge of general laws except by the careful observation of particular facts deeply impressed with these great truths the professors of the new philosophy applied themselves to their tasks and before a quarter of of a century had expired they had given ample earnest of what has since been achieved already a reform of agriculture had been commenced new vegetables were cultivated new implements of husbandry were employed new manures were applied to the soil evelyn had under the formal sanction of the royal society given instruction to his countrymen in planting Temple, in his intervals of leisure, had tried many experiments in horticulture, and had proved that many delicate fruits, the natives of more favoured climates, might, with the help of art, be grown on English ground. Medicine, which in France was still in abject bondage, and afforded an inexhaustible subject of just ridicule to Molière, had in England become an experimental and progressive science and every day made some new advance in defiance of Hippocrates and Galen. The attention of speculative men had been for the first time directed to the important subject of sanitary police. The great plague of 1665 induced them to consider with care the defective architecture, draining and ventilation of the capital. The great fire of 1666 afforded an opportunity for effecting extensive improvements. The whole matter was diligently examined by the Royal Society, and to the suggestions of that body must be partly attributed the changes which, though far short of what the public welfare required, yet made a wide difference between the new and the old London, and probably put a final close to the ravages of pestilence in our country. At the same time, one of the founders of the society, Sir William Petty, created the science of political arithmetic, the humble but indispensable handmaid of political philosophy. No kingdom of nature was left unexplored. To that period belonged the chemical discoveries of Boyle, and the earliest botanical researchers of Sloan. It was then that Ray made a new classification of birds and fishes, and that the attention of Woodward was first drawn towards fossils and shells. One after another, phantoms which had haunted the world through ages of darkness fled before the light. Astrology and alchemy became just. Soon there was scarcely a county in which some of the quorum did not smile contemptuously when an old woman was brought before them for riding on broomsticks or giving cattle the moraine. But it was in those noblest and most arduous departments of knowledge in which induction and mathematical demonstration cooperate for the discovery of truth that the English genius won in that age the most memorable triumphs. John Wallis plays the whole system of statics on a new foundation. Edmund Halley investigated the properties of the atmosphere, the ebb and flow of the sea, the laws of magnetism and the course of the comets. Nor did he shrink from toil, peril and exile in the cause of science. While he, on the rock of St. Helena, mapped the constellations of the southern hemisphere, our national observatory was rising at Greenwich, and John Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal, was commencing that long series of observations which is never mentioned without respect and gratitude in any part of the globe. But the glory of these men, eminent as they were, is cast into the shade by the transcendent lustre of one immortal name. In Isaac Newton, two kinds of intellectual power 
which have little in common and which are not often found together in a very high degree of vigor but which nevertheless are equally necessary in the most sublime departments of physics were united as they have never been united before or since there may have been minds as happily constituted as his for the cultivation of pure mathematical science there may have been minds as happily constituted for the cultivation of science purely experimental but in no other mind have the demonstrative faculty and the inductive faculty coexisted in such supreme excellence and perfect harmony perhaps in the days of scotus and thomas even his intellect might have run to waste as many intellects ran to waste which were inferior only to his happily the spirit of the age on which his lot was cast gave the right direction to his mind and his mind reacted with tenfold force on the spirit of the age in the year 1685 his fame though splendid was only dawning but his genius was in the meridian his great work that work which effected a revolution in the most important provinces of natural philosophy had been completed but was not yet published and was just about to be submitted to the consideration of the royal society end of part 14 history of england from the accession of james the 2nd by thomas babington macaulay